Happy Easter, GCG Nation! With it being Easter at the time of this release, I felt it was a perfect time to discuss more Easter eggs across various GameCube titles, as it has been two years since I released the first video about this topic. Now, as always, this won't be every Easter egg from every game, nor is it every Easter egg within a game I'm covering. Rather, it's the ones I felt were the most interesting to cover for this follow-up episode. If you've missed the first Easter Eggs episode, I will leave a link for that in the description down below, as well as at the end of this video. So, let's dive in and showcase some more GameCube game Easter Eggs. To kick things off, let's start with the phenomenal launch title, Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. Now, Factor 5 truly showcased the GameCube's hardware perfectly at launch, and furthermore, utilized the GameCube's internal clock. There are two missions that actually utilize this, the Tatooine Training Mission and the Imperial Academy Heist. The Tatooine Training has four different times of the day to explore the planet, morning, afternoon, evening, and night. The morning hours you can check out between 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., the afternoon hours is from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., evening hours is from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., and the nighttime hours is from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. Notably, you'll need to complete all of the missions here on the Tatooine Training in each time of day to unlock the Naboo Starfighter, or you could just enter a cheat if you want to go that route too. As for the Imperial Academy Heist, the mission has a daytime and nighttime version depending on what time it actually is. If in the daytime, you will need to use the Y-Wing and its ion cannons to disrupt the radars from discovering you when infiltrating. If playing the nighttime version, you'll instead use the snow speeder to fly fast and low within the fog to avoid detection. Personally, I found the nighttime version easier, but I also just prefer the actual speed of the snow speeder to fly low on the ground. It's a really interesting dynamic to experience for sure. Next up is Madden 2004, in which if you have your internal clock set to any holiday or happen to be playing on that holiday, the announcers will acknowledge that as you start up a match. We're live and getting ready for what should be another great NFL matchup. Happy holidays, everyone, and thanks for joining us for what we hope is another holiday classic. It's subtle, but it adds this nice level of authenticity that the Madden series was always going for. Alright, moving on to another one of my favorites on the GameCube, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. There are actually quite a bit of Easter eggs here. First up, when running through the city escape level with Sonic, you'll notice numerous posters around the area. However, one of the posters is for Knight's Hotel, which Knight's was Sonic Team's Sega Saturn title that became a cult classic. But there's more to this. When playing Radical Highway with Shadow, there's a point halfway through the level where if you're paying attention, you'll see the Knights' character's head spinning on top of a building. This is actually the Knights Hotel that the poster alluded to in the game. Additionally, after beating the City Escape mission and facing the first boss, if you pay attention to one of the billboards above, it's actually for Sonic Team's other title that previously released in the Dreamcast and then made its way to the GameCube, which is Fantasy Star Online. Additionally, when playing the Mad Space level with Rouge, drop from the starting platform here and break this crate. This is actually a blue armor piece from Fantasy Star Online. Then, fly to the section where there are two adjacent platforms and break this crate, and this time it'll be a green item piece from PSO as well. Now, these don't do anything in the game here, but it's a nice nod to their other IP. Lastly, this is a comical easter egg. Go to the hero story mode and select this section here where you face off against the egg golem in the story. Now, when you choose this, the cutscene begins with a door opening normally, nobody behind it. Now, when you initiate this scene again, rapidly press the A button immediately and you'll be greeted by Big the Cat. Furthermore, if you go to the last story section and select the scene before Bio Lizard, rapidly press the A button here as well and Big the Cat will run past Amy who's doing some lame monologue. Keep pressing A though and he'll run past her one more time. I actually thought this was pretty hilarious. Now, moving things over to one of my favorite GameCube games, Super Monkey Ball. When you complete any of the difficulties within the main game mode, you will partake in a mini game during the credits where the developer's names drop letter by letter on the course and you have to try to avoid colliding with these letters while trying to collect as many bananas as possible. It's ultimately just a fun interactive way to go through the credits. However, that's not the easter egg. Instead, you have to try to avoid as many bananas as possible and try to purposely collide with as many letters falling on the course. This way you'll receive negative points. Once complete, you will notice you are ranked with a certain name. 
This sounds like it might have been an inside joke within Amusement Vision of someone that might have been playing the game poorly over there, but who knows, to this day, it's still a mystery. Next, let's look at a few easter eggs within The Simpsons Road Rage. First off, if you notice on the character select screen, there is a question mark slot that appears like an unlockable character. However, that question mark slot is actually for holiday specific vehicles. If you set your GameCube's internal clock to October 31st, you will play as Frankenbart, getting into that Halloween spirit, or in this case, Treehouse of Horror spirit. Set the console to Thanksgiving for a particular year, and you will drive as Pilgrim Marge. Set it to Christmas Day on December 25th, and you'll have Santa Apu to rock around in Springfield. And lastly, set the console to New Year's Day, January 1st, and you will play as Tuxedo Krusty. The vehicles even have their own unique horn to blare. It's a fantastic use of the GameCube's internal clock, for sure. Additionally, in the downtown level, there are two ice cream shops that you can check out. One of them actually has a dirt road path in the back that leads to Nelson's house. When going behind this ice cream shop with the dirt road path, you will find a message that states, Congratulations to Michael and Whitney on their wedding. Happiness always. Love, Springfield. This is most likely insinuated to be a developer of the game that got married during development. Next is within the Evergreen Terrace stage. When going towards Springfield Elementary, you can peek through the window of Bart's classroom and see that a repeated message is written on the chalkboard stating, this is not a clue, or is it? While I don't think it's a clue towards anything within Road Rage, it may have been a clue that they were going to begin working on The Simpsons Hit and Run, possibly. And speaking of which, let's showcase a few Easter eggs in The Simpsons Hit and Run. Setting the console to October 31st will give the main menu a Halloween festive appearance, and December 25th will give the main menu a Christmas festive appearance with the Christmas tree in the background. Next, go to level 6, which is Bart's final chapter you get to play as him. Select a mission, but before actually activating that mission, go to Android's dungeon. Once inside, go to the right of the screen and then zoom in on the wall. You'll see a record that says, Sax on the Beach. This is a reference to the record that Lisa buys for $500 in Season 6, Episode 22, Round Springfield. Next up is Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2. There are actually two Easter eggs to note here. First is that during the loading screen, you could rapidly press buttons to have Master Roshi spin faster on the screen. It's minor, but it's neat, and actually they continue this tradition in Budokai 3's loading screen on the PlayStation 2. The second is actually within the Tenkaichi Budokai stage. If you could knock your opponent out of the right side of the arena, quickly notice that Monkey D and Luffy from One Piece is actually within the audience here. It's a nice nod to see these universes collide. Also, rest in peace, Akira Toriyama, as your work was clearly more influential than many even realized. Moving forward, let's check out the various Easter eggs in Tomb Raider Legend. In Croft Manor, if you look over here by the staircase, there is a portrait of Kane from Legacy of Kane, but this is before he became a vampire. Furthermore, if you wear Lara's goth outfit, look at her belt buckle, which will have the Legacy of Kane logo on it. It's a pretty cool way to tie in Crystal Dynamics' previous efforts. Next, in the second level, Peru, there is a soccer ball in the beginning, and you can kick it using the Y button. If you can kick the ball past the dummy guard, you will receive fanfare. And at this point, I think Lara is ready for the World Cup. In the England stage, when entering King Arthur's tomb more than halfway through the level, equip your binoculars and look up over here. The message here reads Crystal Dynamics Rules, but the R letters are missing. It's a neat little message that the team left here for those looking around. And I would agree, back then, Crystal Dynamics did rule. Nowadays, that's very debatable. Lastly, in the final battle, if you get a chance to carefully look at the boxes near the pillars, they say Natla Industries. This is a reference to the very first Tomb Raider game and what would allude to the next installment, Tomb Raider Anniversary. Next up is Blood Rain. The first easter egg can be found actually pretty much at the beginning of the first main level of the game. At the start, go into the church that's straight ahead. If you attack the cross that's in there, lightning will strike and the ground will start to shake. I'd say God is pretty pissed off at you right now. Another can be found upon reaching the communication breakdown stage, or this particular level highlighted here that's in the level select cheat screen. 
There's a section where a guard takes a battery from an elevator. After this brief scene, jump down to the bottom floor after taking the enemies out, and then you'll notice a few doorways here. Enter the one to the right over here, which then leads to a closet with a shovel and crate inside. Break open the crate, and the covenant from Raiders of the Lost Ark will be revealed. Just be sure not to open it. Then again, I suppose if you did open it with your eyes closed, you could defeat all the Nazis here effortlessly, but then that would also not make for much of a game afterwards. Next are a few easter eggs in Dr. Mudo. In the lab hub area at the start of the game, explore the area to find a fish tank. Now, switch to first person view to look inside. What you'll find is that each fish has the face of Scott Amos, who's the senior producer of the game. Now, from here, go up the stairs and go into Dr. Mudo's bedroom, and you'll notice a toilet that's right next to his bed. Seriously, who has a toilet right next to their bed? Anyway, hold the zap button down next to it and you'll hear the toilet flushing itself. But keep zapping and you'll start hearing good quality gas releasing. Additionally, Dr. Mudo does have some quality posters pinned to the ceiling of his bed. Moving on to a franchise that Ubisoft appears to have forgotten about is Splinter Cell. In the CIA HQ mission, when you're pursuing Michael Doherty, there's a side room you can visit after he talks to one of the staff members. Once the area is cleared, go in here and take out the guard. Now, check out the vending machine straight ahead and you can zoom in and you'll see bags of Rayman snacks. I would have bought these if they were real. And jumping from first to last series-wise on the platform, next is Splinter Cell Double Agent. This version is quite different from the 360 PS3 version that released, and ironically, this is the actual canon one story-wise. Anyway, playing through the first mission, as you approach the end of it, there is a light switch in the room where you need to get Kadir's member list from the computer. If you activate this light switch 60 times, 6-0, then leave and open the garage door using the keypad, a secret Sam Fisher rap theme will start playing for the remainder of the mission. Considering what's about to go down in the story, it is a bit of a mood killer, but it's still wild to see that this was hidden here to discover this unused track. To wrap it up, we're taking it back to a GameCube exclusive, Super Mario Sunshine. Now, some of these here may already be fairly well known, but I still feel like they should be highlighted. First off, in the Serena Beach level, if you climb to the top of the hotel from the outside and look out towards the courtyard and beach, you'll notice that the courtyard is actually designed to be the shape and layout of the GameCube controller. Additionally, the first mission within Serena Beach where you're facing off against the Phantom Manta creature that's moving its way onto the beach is actually a reference to The Shining. In The Shining, the characters are fleeing from the burning hotel and one of the characters notices, as quoted in the book, a ghostly manta shape floating away over the hotel. It was paper thin, like a shadow, and then broke into smaller forms before turning into smoke and drifting away. It definitely is an homage considering that the level revolves around a hotel and the boss battle is basically what's described here. Additionally, upon acquiring the flood pack in the intro, if you look very closely at the bottom left of the screen here, you'll notice certain scenarios from across various Mario games that are showcased. It's a nice little touch considering that Flood is scanning Mario and it's showcasing his history as he determines who he is. Lastly, Nintendo sure went tongue in cheek with the game's Dolphin references. Since the GameCube was codenamed Dolphin, almost everything about Super Mario Sunshine has a Dolphin Incorporated. For example, Isle Delfino being Italian for Dolphin Island. The shape of Isle Delfino being exactly that of a dolphin. There are dolphin statues throughout, as well as dolphin graffiti that you'll clean up at later points in the game. You can't help but shake the feeling that Nintendo still wanted to utilize that codename in other ways, and honestly, that's pretty awesome. Seeing developers incorporate these types of easter eggs really is wild. It adds another layer to the game in some ways, giving something for players to pay close attention to around the game world they're exploring. Did you know about any of these easter eggs highlighted in this episode? Any other easter eggs from other GameCube games you recall standing out? Sound off in the comments below as I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe as the support is greatly appreciated. I hope you all enjoyed and I'll catch you all in the next episode GCG Nation. Mm -hmm.